we are getting the session started. If everyone can see the screen behind us, Henrietta has some uh, interactive uh, component of her talk. So if you can download the EduVote app and log in with the ID there, that would help. Um, we will kick off the session because I know there's a lot of people that need to leave including our first speaker to make her flight in time. Um, my name's uh, Rebecca Burgill. I'm a gastroenterologist from Melbourne, Australia, and I'm super happy that we're coming to the most important part of this meeting, which is the clinical impact of all these wonderful, amazing tests that we do and how we integrate that with our patient care. So we've got some phenomenal expert speakers um, today from all over the world um, who will walk us through, to start with, um, approach to health, um, but then proceeding through managing faecal incontinence, constipation, and then we'll really have some open discussion, hopefully, with some uh, cases for the pelvic floor MDT, and hopefully we can get everyone in the audience involved in that. So without further ado, I'll hand over to my co-chair. Hi, I'm Jose Remes from Veracruz. I'm also a gastroenterologist and a neurogastroenterologist. And we'll start with the first session. This is uh, structure, motility, sensation, how those continents function, work in health. Lessons learned from manometry, ultrasound, barostat, and imaging. This will be a joint session by uh, Henrietta Henrich from Basel and Hugo Grossi from Treviso, Italy. Go ahead. Thank you for the very nice introduction. And we're going to start very easy and then go to the more complicated things. We're going to talk about um, tests of anorectal function in health. And we are not only going to let you sit and watch, we're, we're going to test your knowledge. And I hope everyone has seen the first page now, has loaded down the app, because we're going to m try and make it as interactive as possible. Um, so without further ado, we'll do a test question. Um, what is the normal stool frequency in a healthy volunteer per week? Is it two times? Is it eight to 14 times? Is it three to seven times? Is it 15 to 21 times? Or is it more than three? I would ask you to vote now. No, you have to, so it should work now because I started the... Yes. Yeah. Mm. So you see the, you see the ID down there? This is the, the ID that you need to put into the app. So nine people have voted. Code. No, there's no then session code. code. You just you start voting. Yes. Start vote. And then go ten yes. Right. <laughs> so 12. Any more? Anyone wants to take a guess? I'm going to stop it so that everyone has a chance. 14. Okay. C. C is the right question, so we're all experts here, but there is a little bit of division between A, B, and E, but the right answer is C, three to seven times. So we jump right in. We're going to talk about the anal rectum, and the, the things that I'm going to talk about is the anal sphincter, how to measure it in manometry in health, and also about the rectum, how to, what a normal rectum does how large it is, and what it should be able to take. What, when you talk about measuring pressure, you need to decide what is normal. And this is um, a study by Adil, um, where he made normal values with high resolution anorectal mon manometry, comparing men and women, and correlating that to age. And what you see in men and women with normal balloon expulsion time that as you age, your resting pressure gets lower, but resting pressure is quite the same for men and women. It gets a bit different when you look at the, at the squeeze pressure, and what you can see here also, depending on whether you have a normal bet or not, and depending on the age, um, that men can squeeze harder than women. <laughs> 
also depends on motivation, but men can squeeze harder. <coughs> Who can simulate defecation better? That's also a question. Um, the recto-anal gradient is higher in women than in men, um, and I'm not quite sure why that is that way, but women tend to be able to build up a more positive recto-anal um, gr pressure gradient than men. So coming back to another landmark study by my colleague Ugo, does anyone remember what the percentage of healthy volunteers approximately is that show dysinergia on manometry? Emma will surely be able to... Exactly. <laughs> Very good call. <laughs> You're going to find one. So I'm starting the poll now. And you can start voting now. Is it A, 20%, B, 1%, 3, 40%, D, 75%, or last one, 80%? We have 12 people, 13, 14, 17, 19, great, everyone is on board. I'm gonna close the vote when I reach 20, so please vote. Oh, there we go, there we go. There go. so I'm gonna stop now. Okay. There seems to be division, maybe that's based on a different data set that we're referring to, but the correct answer is E, 80%, approximately. Well reflects the publications, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, that is a publication <laughs> bias. It's, it's the way you count it is completely... Yeah. Thank you for your comment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, that, if that was true, would anyone do the Manuel test? Seriously. No, but everyone does it in spite of it, Mark. No, not no. in spite. <laughs> no, I'm showing the original data. This is a summary study where a large number of healthy volunteers has dysinergia. But of course, this has been debunked by recent studies where you can actually use the recto-anal pressure gradient for um, diagnosing dysinergia rather well. But this is about patterns. Coming back to or moving on to the rectum. And this is something that Mark will be able to comment on very well, and I suspect that he will be able to give the right answer because he is the author of the famous Stocky study. I didn't ask what color, the correct color of Stocky is because that would probably you as the only person be, to be able to answer that. But the question is, how much can a normal rectum take? Is it 850 milliliters? Is it 500 milliliters? Is it 600 milliliters? Is it 200 milliliters? Or is it 300 milliliters? We're not talking about Baristat, but we're actually talking about a test of retention, where Stocky is being put into the rectum of healthy volunteers. So, so please, take your guess. Rectum, in that case, it's whatever you might imagine is holding uh, What is Stocky? <laughs> Stocky is potato porridge. Oh, yeah. So I'm, <coughs> so I'm going to start, but you're never going to forget the results that way. <laughs> so please vote. A, 850, almost a liter. B, 500. C, 600. D, 200. E, 300. There's lots of discussion going on. How much can a rectum take? 20, anyone wants to pitch in? No? 20. I'm gonna stop. <clears throat> C, interesting. So, Mark, what's the right answer? It's around, it's over 1,000. So the largest number was the right number. So this is Mark's study on um, the famous Stocky or potato porridge test, 
where he looked at rectal barostat measures, anal manometry, and the retention test, um, and showed that when you do a barostat, um, the median volume is about 390, and during the retention test, the maximum is 1,500, which is really large. And of course, the retention test doesn't only measure the rectum because also a part of the stocky goes up to the sigmoid. And how does it all work together? Um, this is also something that Mark explored. Um, you look at this curve of um, strength of association, rectal filling, um, and the first awareness of rectal filling in this study correlated to the resting pressure and to rectal capacity. That changed as you were filling more, so there was less dependency on resting pressure, uh, but the association with your squeeze pressure strength with regards to rectal capacity and anorectal sensation, um, it depend that, that had an impact on your continence function. So sphincter pressure, rectal capacity, um, and sensation, they all work together in keeping us able to retain about one liter of Stocky. And with this, I want to hand over to Ugo, who is going to talk about um, imaging and ultrasound. Thank you, Edward. Thanks, Mark, for the invitation, and I'm so glad to be here. Um, okay, so. Let's go. I'll, I'm trying to continue the story. And uh, um, we're striving to find what's behind the maintenance of human continents in this uh, seminal work uh, dating back uh, almost 40 years ago. Um, John Pemberton and Kate Kelly identified at least eight uh, mechanisms behind the maintenance of human continents. We are striving to find out what's more uh, as you can see, there are anatomical, physiological factors, and uh, also colonic transit and stool volume and consistency. So we are also striving to find the holy grail of testing. Uh, several tests have come into uh, our own practice. Uh, we don't know what the future reserves to us. We'll see. So let's start with this first uh, uh, question, because we are always been fascinating on the definition of normality when we do test. So um, in our imagination, uh, the concept of abnormal is something that we don't see, we never see in a healthy subject. So let's have a guess. And uh, to find out how many females with fecal incontinence have normal sphincter morphology. Correct. Structural, yeah. You all know that the slide I'm going to show now reflects uh, our own practice that may or may not reflect your own practice, but these are data we, um, we extrapolated from a court of patients referred to Barts, London, during my PhD. So let's go. Okay, interesting, yeah. And now, uh, how many males with fecal incontinence um, have, yeah, may have a structural, <coughs> um, I mean, structurally normal anal sphincters? Fourteen, fifteen. One more? Yeah, <laughs> got it. <clears throat> okay, okay, very interesting. Okay, I think our practice quite well reflects uh, our own practice. So um, uh, we um, tried to answer this question a few years ago, uh, making um, a case match study of 200 patients 
um, evaluating 100 males compared to um, a court of uh, age-matched females. So what we found was that uh, about one-fourth of female had a normal sphincter, the white uh, area, uh, as compared to more than 60% of males. Uh, this let us conclude that uh, pathophysiology mechanism behind fecal incontinence differ between sexes. And anal sphincter dysfunction was less commonly found in males that uh, presented impaired rectal sensation and functional evacuatory disorders instead. Now, I think, uh, yeah, uh, how many healthy females have abnormal sphincter morphology? Let's look at the other side of the coin. So we look at healthy females and let's have a guess on how many of them may have, may still have an abnormal sphincter? Have had children or have not had children? <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, uh, looking at the general population, yeah. please. <laughs> yeah, stop. Okay, okay, quite interesting. Now, to answer this question gently, um, <laughs> a, very st a very nice study from a deal uh, tried to resolve this clue. So uh, he uh, assessed more than 100 asymptomatic female, mean age 50 years old, without risk factors for anorectal trauma, anal sphincter appearance, anorectal motion, and pelvic organ prolapse. And sphincter abnormalities, defined as focal mild or marked thinning or scarring, were found in 10% of these uh, subjects. Now, the last question. Which one of the following findings is less likely encountered on defecography in a healthy subject? Oh, okay. that one's sorry. No, no, I, I haven't. Can you can you go back? No. Good. No one wants to laugh. <laughs> Last question. It would be great if we got 20 again. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, 18. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Fabulous. Let's see. Wow. 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 <laughs> okay. Well done. Okay. Fantastic. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, it's fine. It's fine. Um, as as uh, multiple times um, uh, mentioned during this session, uh, behind the defecatory disorder uh, lay multiple structural and functional abnormalities. So we tried a few years ago to uh, run a uh, systematic review on the role of defecography in uh, assessing structural and functional abnormalities uh, with a special uh, look into healthy individuals. And uh, we found 63 studies uh, up to 2017. Uh, unfortunately, just for a matter of month, I missed one brilliant Adil studies uh, that I mentioned later. Uh, uh, 53 were on uh, uh, barium defecography and five on uh, MRI defecography, and five studies directly compared the, the two uh, approaches. So by combining the subjects included in the study, we could analyze uh, more than 200 healthy individuals uh, under, uh, who underwent barium defecography and 50 uh, MRI defecography. So, uh, 
Um, as you can see, distribu gender distribution was quite different because among healthy individuals, there, there was a quite a fair distribution uh, as compared to the constipated population uh, where female were prevalent. But uh, at our first look, when we first uh, identified the prevalence of an internal prolapse and the rectocele, for example, we could still find these abnormalities into the healthy population. But when we restricted our uh, diagnostic criteria, so only looking at very large rectocele, more than four centimeter depth, and um, only to rectoanal intersusception, so internal prolapse that went down to the anal canal, we could not find any of those abnormalities in the healthy uh, population. So we were able, in a way, to define what, were, uh, what should be considered clinically insignificant abnormalities because, um, indeed, they are present in health, <coughs> um, as compared to significant structural abnormalities uh, in the constipated pay population. And with this light, I thank you for your attention. <laughs> and just for the sake of the next presenters, we would be very grateful to have a technician here to reconnect the, the main computer. Thank you. Well, while we uh, sort out the technical aspects, um, I'll take a moment to welcome our two next speakers to the front. Um, both these speakers really need no introduction at all as some of the biggest names in our field. Um, but uh, speaking on both the identifying the causes of symptoms with phenotypic variation in fecal incontinence, I'll ask Adil and Charlie um, to come forwards. Thank you, Rebecca. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jose. So we're going to tag team this um, presentation. And I think the objective of tag teaming this is that I will provide the perspective, hopefully, of a gastroenterologist, Dr. Knowles, of, of a colorectal surgeon. These are my device uh, disclosures, none of which are germane to today's presentation. So my summary of my talk is that in essence, we have um, two ways in which we can phenotype patients with fecal incontinence. One is based on whether they have bowel disturbances, erectile dysfunctions, or both. And then one can subtype patients depending upon the uh, combination of erectile dysfunctions. Arguably, the most widely used system to phenotype patients today is one that's primarily based on symptoms, that is, into urge, passive, or, or mixed fecal incontinence. This is a concept that has content validity. It makes sense to those of us that see patients. It can be defined by questions. It's associated with the impact on quality of life and on uh, with anorectal and perhaps colonic sensory motor dysfunctions. <laughs> the phenotypes also guide therapy in many patients, but um, unfortunately, we don't have any studies that can uh, confirm this so far. So Nick Reed, as, as always, was, was the first to um, describe urge fecal incontinence, and he got the definition right because he defined it as the acute desire to defecate, which would have resulted in incontinence if it was not relieved within 30 seconds. And I'll just remind you all that in the Wazy St. Mark's questionnaire, uh, urgency is described as present if um, you can't defer uh, uh, defecation for 15 minutes to virtually all my patients, and in fact, many healthy people, 15 minutes is a lifetime. Well, Andrew Engel in this paper from 1985 was the first to describe passive fecal incontinence as the leakage of fecal material without realizing it. Um, that's unconscious, including soiling. And he also described this post-defecatory incontinence, which one encounters quite often, but there's not been much work done on it um, uh, since. So these are the four questions that um, I will try and address. And the first three questions were addressed in a population-based study, and I show this merely because a population-based study eliminates many of the biases that um, 
BISET um, studies that are done in clinical practice. It was a questionnaire-based community survey in over 5,000 women, of whom 500 had fecal incontinence. And then we, in this uh, multivariable uh, logistic regression analysis, and the outcome here is fecal incontinence, yes or no, we assess the utility of a combination of variables. That's anorectal injury characterized by none, a history of C-section or uncomplicated vaginal delivery or complicated vaginal delivery, and bowel symptoms for predicting fecal incontinence. And when you look down the line at various combinations, you'll find that women who reported the symptom of rectal urgency on average had an eightfold increased risk of fecal incontinence even after you adjusted for constipation and diarrhea. In other words, this urgency was not just secondary to diarrhea. It was even after you adjusted for diarrhea. The second question becomes, well, is urgency a risk factor for incontinent stools in women with um, uh, fecal incontinence? So here we looked at 176 randomly selected women from this cohort of 500. All of them came in, and they filled out a bowel diary for two weeks. And then we uh, assessed um, the circumstances surrounding the continent and incontinent bowel movements, um, all of them. And you can find surprise, surprise, that nearly 60% of bowel incontinent bowel movements versus only 30% of continent bowel movements were preceded by marked urgency. The third question becomes, well, is rectal urgency associated with the worst quality of, of life? So we computed the impact of incontinence on quality of life, and then we compared it in women with versus without urgency. So these are the four domains in our fecal incontinence symptom severity score, the frequency, composition, amount of leakage, and the presence or absence of urgency in, in passive stool. And the numbers in parentheses reflect the quality of life impact score. Happy to answer questions about how we calculated this. And you go across horizontally for each domain, you'll see that these numbers are greater, and it makes sense um, for uh, to, to the right, especially for urgency. Notice the difference between, between urge and passive in, fecal incontinence, and patients who had uh, combined fecal incontinence, the impact on quality of life was even worse. This slide <clears throat> summarizes the key studies that have evaluated the relationship between the phenotypes and uh, the anorectal dysfunctions. In the study by Engel, he reported, as have others, that in general, urge is associated with external sphincter dysfunction. Passive, as you might anticipate, because the internal sphincter is, is weak, is associated with internal sphincter dysfunction. And then there are a variety of studies right, shown right here that have shown to, you know, with some minor variations, that urge fecal incontinence is associated with a smaller rectal reservoir, often with reduced rectal compliance and with rectal hypersensitivity. Whereas this, these two studies here, this one confirm uh, that passive fecal incontinence is associated with a lower resting and squeeze pressure, um, uh, shown right here. So with the barostat, one can assess not only rectal volume, but also pressure thresholds. And uh, in this uh, paper from, from us, you can see that the volume at the maximum tolerated distending pressure was lower than the fifth percentile value for controls in approximately one in five women with fecal incontinence. And you might say, well, who cares about it? But it actually is associated with symptoms. So in women who didn't have urgency, rectal capacity was generally normal, as shown here in yellow, whereas in women with urgency, roughly one in three had reduced rectal capacity. And the reduced rectal capacity was associated with increased rectal sensation. So when rectal, in women with normal rectal capacity, sensation was generally normal. In women who had reduced rectal capacity but were more likely to have exaggerated rectal sensation. And so this then gets into to the bigger issue, that is that 
fecal incontinence, as you all know, is characterized by multifaceted <clears throat> inorectal dysfunctions. The seminal study by Nick Reed and, and, and Son, over 300 patients. And you can see that the most common disturbance was weakness of the external anal sphincter. Over 80% of these patients, roughly half, also had weakness of the internal anal sphincter. On the other hand, all patients who had weakness of the internal sphincter also had weakness of the external anal sphincter, not surprising because the external sphincter is affected first in obstetric trauma. But at the far right, you can see um, uh, that uh, approximately 20% have reduced rectal sensation, whereas approximately 45% have increased uh, rectal sensation as shown right here in the purple bar. So this last slide actually comes back to the point that <clears throat> uh, Phil Dilling mentioned about sacral nerve stimulation and how that might work by actually delaying colonic transit. This is a classical paper, sometimes forgotten by Guido Basilisco, <clears throat> in which he uh, evaluated pa patients with uh, irritable bowel syndrome and compared patients with uh, urgency shown here in gray with versus patients without urgency shown here in, in, in black. And notice that colonic transit was shorter, implying faster transit, not only total, but especially in the left colon in these patients who had urgency. And perhaps this fast colonic transit um, overwhelms the, the capacity of a smaller rectal reservoir uh, as, as shown right here, particularly in the context of anal weakness predisposing to fecal incontinence. And he also showed, although this was not quite significant, um, that transit was associated with a lower threshold for urgency. So it was, in a sense, almost a triple whammy. You had faster transit, stiffer rectal reservoir, and a more sensitive to rectum. And so I've summarized this is um, based, partly based on the evidence. This is partly based on uh, clinical gestalt, if you will. Um, anal pressures, predominantly reduction of squeeze pressures in patients with urge fecal incontinence, whereas in passive fecal incontinence, it's both resting and squeeze pressures that are reduced. Rectal evacuation, typically normal here, may be reduced in some patients who have passive fecal incontinence, often reduced in, just clinically in patients who have post-defecation fecal incontinence. We've talked about rectal capacity and sensation. In urge fecal incontinence, I will begin with bowel modifiers. Use loperamide. If they have bile acid malabsorption, I'll use bile acid uh, binders. I might use a 5-HC3 antagonist, such as ondansetron, or amitriptyline, which in one small study is shown to reduce that excessive rectal contractility. By contrast, in passive fecal incontinence, I will treat the associated constipation, use anal plugs. We're doing a study with that, or consider perianal injection of, of dextranomer. I think there's a role for biofeedback therapy in all three entities. Sacral nerve simulation, arguably more helpful in patients with urge fecal incontinence. Surgery, who knows if it helps at all. <laughs> <laughs> and so to finish up, We've talked about this classification, which is a concept that has content validity defined by questions associated with impact on quality of life, underpinned by anorectal and perhaps colonic sensory motor dysfunction, and guides therapy in some patients. Thank you. Thank you. We're a little bit over time. Are you happy to take questions at the end during the pelvic floor discussion? We'll, we'll move on to... to uh, Charlie's talk, who hopefully can answer the question of whether surgery can be helpful here. <laughs> Not the uh, primary aim of my talk to advertise <laughs> surgery, but the um, uh, um, but I'm going to give a surgeon's perspective um, on this subject. And uh, we're obviously at a meeting where we're looking mainly at testing. Um, but I want to add some sort of pragmatic guidance from my life in terms of what we actually do in practice. So um, again, a number of disclosures, but I don't think they affect the content of this talk at all. So as a surgeon, we're rather limited in what we can do. The uh, surgeons manually restore anatomy. 
we cut things away, we join them together, we pull things up, we tighten them, we loosen. That's all surgeons can do. In the case of incontinence, we have another role, and that is where there's a delivery of a, a, a functional cure may require a surgeon to put it in, and that refers to neuromodulation, and now in the era of cell therapies, also to the injection of cells um, that's sometimes done under anaesthetic. But uh, one of my main roles, at least in practice, is the prevention of unnecessary surgery. And that's an important role in anyone who deals with functional. Please ignore the title on this slide, which is a, 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 is a legacy title. But these are the, um, uh, an algorithm from the International Continent Society in relation to fecal incontinence. And you can see in the red box that I've provided for you here that we're rather limited in evidence-based treatments. We broadly have treatments for prolapse that we can do. We have treatments for people with severe sphincter defects that require um, or may merit a more radical surgery. And then across the groups, we've got sacral neuromodulation and, of course, the uh, resort to a colostomy, which still has value in some patients. And I think one of the things you can see from this slide <coughs> is that we can't agree on very much because you end up with several of those options down each of the, um, uh, uh, the columns. One thing perhaps we are all in agreement with, however, is the need of a multidisciplinary team to make difficult decisions like this, um, particularly because the evidence base, as Adil has said in the last talk, is extremely poor. And so a number of these judgments are value-based, and we don't want to do harm to patients. And when it comes to an MDT in practice, what you do is you look at the history and the symptoms, the examination findings, and then the results of relevant tests of the sort that we've been discussing over the past few days at this meeting. And what I describe is the duck test. That's that if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and swims like a duck, then it probably is a duck. That means that if the history and the symptoms align with the examination findings and those align with the results of various tests, then you have an increased degree of confidence that what you're going to do to that patient that may have a risk of harm is actually going to benefit them. And then you review that possible target pathophysiology for surgery against the uh, exhaustion of previous options, some of which we've heard from the last speaker, which should be tried first, the patient's fitness for surgery and any other factors that come in, and then some procedural um, factors that are always relevant to surgeons, uh, anatomically, et cetera. And at the Cleveland Clinic, we have a multidisciplinary team um, group that includes a broad spread of people, including urologists and urogynecologists, and the importance of that I will come back to. A thing we barely talked about at this whole meeting is clinical examination. And I'm afraid we have to talk about it because it vastly, it really is important. Mm. You know, I'm not going to teach you to suck eggs here. You all know how to examine. So, but obviously, there are things that you look for. There are things that on examination may be important, particularly on a digital rectal examination. And one thing not to forget is that the pelvic floor is one basin of muscles with um, several holes in it. And when a problem goes wrong with one of them, it goes wrong with often more than one of them. And so they are a very low threshold for performing a urogynecological examination. And if you know how to do it, a pop Q score that looks at all of the compartments. And if you do that, then you can immediately find the obvious findings, things like full thickness rectal prolapse and cloacal defects that clearly are going to require a surgical solution. We won't, there are a small number of patients and we won't talk about them more now. In terms of whether you perform a sphincter repair, the key point comes entirely from a clinical examination because a sphincter repair does not restore function. Okay, how could it? How can you tighten an old and atrophic muscle? You wouldn't do it anywhere else in the body and expect that to improve function. You, you, you repair a sphincter defect to close the defect and there has to be a gutter for that defect to leak, or a fistula, or a cloaca. That is the indication for surgery, and that can be found with your finger. It does not require any other test to do so. So you don't do it in that situation. Again, those patients are not uncommon. And then we come to testing. I don't need to go over the tests. We've spent several days looking at them. But there's anorectal manometry, which obviously tests function. We can test structure using endoanal ultrasound. And rectal sensory testing is important for a number of reasons, probably um, in relation to some of the therapies um, that we will discuss. So having 
talked about the examination, we come back to this slide. How important are the history and symptoms? Because the title I was given is about symptom correlation and phenotype. So how much does any of that matter when I've told you you need to examine the patient and do the relevant tests? And that's what I'm going to talk to you about in the rest of this talk. Well, history, I believe, is very important. And it comes back to the duct test. You're not going to diagnose a sphincter defect in a patient who has no reason for having a sphincter defect. They simply have to have had a child or some other trauma of the anal sphincter for this to happen. And this is uh, uh, the Nature Review that I was involved with, led by Adil, um, who you've just heard from. And there's a very well-established textbook list of um, historical risk factors for incontinence contained within there and elsewhere. And in fact, we recently did a Delphi exercise in the UK. This is with the National <coughs> Pelvic Floor Society. And across surgeons and physiotherapists and colorectal nurses and the other people who contributed to this, the same historical things come up. Don't worry about the data on the slide, but <coughs> you can see that most people agree that the sort of things that are in a textbook are important to establish in the history of a patient with fecal incontinence. And if we then look at data, and these are data from our local population in London. This is data from 1.1 million adults in our area in four boroughs of London. And it comes from primary care data. And it looks at where faecal incontinence has ever been recorded by the GP in the patient's record, OK, on an electronic patient record. And the results are obviously a, very, a much smaller proportion than one finds by didactic surveys where you ask, questions, but 0.3% of our population have had incontinence sufficient for it to have been written in their primary care record. And it's interesting, <coughs> excuse me, that Ugo put up the Pemberton slide, you know, with these eight pathophysiologies, and there's no mention of the brain. I mean, look at the brain. These are all the things that are associated in the modern world with incontinence. <coughs> and the, the, the commonest causes of incontinence are problems of cognition. That's the world we now live in, hugely high odds ratios. So we can't ignore the brain in this, and that's a critically important thing because obviously you don't want to go repairing the sphincter in someone where the problem is the brain. Um, so what do I actually do in practice? Well, on the EPIC system that you use at work, you can have smart text, so you can build anything you want and press a button and it comes down. So I have my acronym COASTED in there. So I acknowledge what Adil has said. It is important that we know whether someone predominantly has urge or passive incontinence or post-defecatory um, symptoms. But is that very important? Because I've already said the onset of this, what it relates to historically is incredibly important in my mindset of where we're going with treatment. And possibly more important than going into detail of the incontinence symptoms themselves is knowing about the other symptoms a patient has. So diarrhea, that many of my treatments are not going to work in the face of chronic diarrhea. That needs to be treated by someone clever like the gastroenterologist who are amongst us today. Similarly, severe constipation or an overlap of ODS symptoms pushes us down another diagnostic route, which I will come to. Symptoms of prolapse, particularly vaginal bulging, um, may be very important with reference to rectocele. And urinary symptoms are important in the mindset of what we do for patients as well. Obviously, we want to work out how severe this is, the effect it has on quality of life, because that pushes our goals for therapy and possibly how invasive we will be. The tractability to previous treatments is important, because uh, not least for the licensing of some treatments. And we want to know exacerbating and relieving factors and the minimum duration um, which is important for some treatments. So I said about obstructive defecation symptoms. We know these overlap. This is a paper from Paul Volibrecht, who's in the audience in our group, that shows the colossal and unrecognized overlap of symptoms that are broadly constipation with those that are incontinence, that are unrecognized unless you ask about it. And if you have those symptoms, then one has to consider whether adjunctive tests on top of doing an endoanal ultrasound and an anorectal manometry are relevant. And I'm not going to get into the debate about barium versus MRI proctogram, other than to say that if you've also asked about symptoms of urinary and gynecological function and prolapse, you may be pushed to doing an MR proctogram because of its obvious advantages at looking at all of the compartments. 
Similarly, there are instances of previous surgery like mesh rectopexies and things where an MRI is uh, 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 clearly um, uh, uh, a more advantageous examination. But barium, if you only have obstructive defecation, has a higher sensitivity. It's been shown in several studies recently. The study from Peter Christensen's group in Denmark categorically shows if you're looking for interception and rectocele and nothing else, then barium is better. And that takes us on to the first group on the slide I showed you earlier. If your main problem is one of prolapse and evacuation, then your surgery should be directed to prolapse and evacuation. And there are studies that show that if you use neuromodulation, for instance, in that group of patients, it will not work, or it will work less well than it works. And there are a number of studies that show that. And in fact, the best treatment surgically for incontinence, if you want to look at the actual data, is in women with a large rectocele and post defecatory leakage. The most successful operation we have across the course is a rectocele repair. 90% success rate of curing fecal incontinence in people with a large symptomatic rectocele. Also in relation to other symptoms, urinary symptoms. If a patient has urge fecal incontinence and they also have overactive bladder, then this is obviously relevant because treatments like sacral neuromodulation are primarily directed at overactive bladder and may also help urge fecal incontinence, and that should be reviewed at an MDT. So then we come on to the, other, the actual symptoms of incontinence themselves. And this is um, uh, um, uh, some data, again, from the paper I presented earlier. And it's got a huge amount of data in. But what it does show, and, and the, you know, don't worry too much about what's on here, but if you look as a whole across the group, what it shows you is that if you have defecatory symptoms of obstructed defecation, you are more likely um, uh, um, to have a, an outcome from your pathophysiological examination that show a structural or functional problem of evacuation. So there is some correlation there. And there are particular things like vaginal bulging that are very highly correlated with finding things like a rectocele. So if you ask about those symptoms, you can then go and look for those problems which may affect what you do. This is looking at it another way in terms of phenotypes of those three groups those with incontinence alone, those with constipation alone, and those with coexistence. I don't want to worry about too much about what's on there. But to point out this, if we look at what predicts, if you like, the pathophysiology, is it the symptoms or is it the history? I've already told you the history is important. What's more important of those two? Do the symptoms add a great deal if you've asked about the history? Well, we had a look at this, and we've, there's a study that we haven't published the data on, um, which uses a Bayesian approach, um, at incorporating the Delphi knowledge into a model, which is incredibly complicated when you look at it. But the, uh, to cut a long story short, if you perform <coughs> that model to look at the prediction of eventual pathophysiology based on the standard tests, using only the historical information about the patient, their risk factors, the performance of the model is better than if you add in the symptoms. So that's the takeaway message. The symptoms detract from the information that you get from taking history. Now, I'm not here to say you should stop asking about symptoms. Obviously, we're not going to stop asking about symptoms. But I do say we ought to recognize that symptoms of themselves, as they are in many areas of humanity, are not always terribly specific if you're worried about pathophysiology. In terms of licensing for things like sacral neuromodulation, you have to ask about symptoms. You have to ask about the duration, the, um, um, the, bowel free, the incontinence frequency, um, and the other things that I've already um, talked about. And you have to have a numeric var uh, value of that for the bowel diary to have this um, crazy 50% rule from the test phase. And Adil has touched on this and this comes to these symptom questionnaires that we've got. And there's a whole panoply of these out there. I've got them on the next slide for a summary. But the, um, the problem we've got is there are semantic differences in what people report. We'll never get over this, particularly in a multinational. Seepage, leakage, staining, soiling, all of the different things mean different things to different people.
they're unpopular to fill in. Most people fill them in in the car park just to get the next stage of their therapy. There are real problems around capturing urgency, as Adil's pointed out, versus urge incontinence. An urgency may be very important. And they ignore waiting. The VASI score weights liquid incontinence the same as solid. Liquid incontinence runs down your leg. Talk to your patients. They all fear liquid incontinence. It's much worse than having. There's no waiting in these things. And they're difficult to analyze, particularly in contents episodes, because of the press on distribution and the flooring effect. So they're not great in studies. So they all have frailties. And my personal view, and it's shared by the Harvard professor of business in a, a book on the subject, is that we have an over-reliance on symptoms that you know, we've done because we wanted to save money. And actually, we haven't saved money by doing <coughs> measuring symptoms at all and classifying people. Those are the various things available. They all have frailties. Um, uh, uh, few of them are validated, and those that are um, have some of the problems that I've alluded to. So in summary, when it comes to surgery and phenotyping fecal incontinence, I think the symptoms are rather poorly defined, the pathophysiology of fecal incontinence, at least in practice. I mean, you ask about the main ones. The history, the examination, and the diagnostics, what I've described as a triple assessment, remains absolutely essential if you're going along the line of surgery. And I would stress, because it's not globally um, uh, uh, enacted at the moment, that an MDT review, including a view of the whole pelvis in women, um, is, um, is critically important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. I think we are running off time, so I don't know if we have time for questions or I later. Think, I think we should, because um, the, the, maybe we should have that uh, talk at the end of the whole session. Okay. Um, because uh, it will give everyone a chance to give the presentation, and those of you that wish to spend a bit more time discussing these issues could do so. Perfect. So we already heard how challenging it could be phenotyping in fecal incontinence. Let's see if Satish and Rebecca can help us in constipation. One moment, I'll just get this up. Okay. All right. Um, I think it gets even more complicated uh, with constipation. Um, so I guess we're asking the question here is, you know, what is the role of symptoms and how do we phenotype patients with constipation? I'm also going to, I suppose, slightly controversially ask the question of, does it matter? So I have no disclosures. But really our goals when we're thinking about phenotyping our patients is, you know, what are we going to do with them? There is no point having a test, really, that distinguishes between health and symptoms because the patient's coming to us because they're unhealthy, they have a problem. So. Really, the goal of phenotyping is we must be able to identify physiological targets and that those targets critically improve our outcomes in our patients, because that's really what we're there for. So I know everyone in this audience is very expert, and we've already proven with Henrietta Zanugo's talk today that we should know these answers, but what is constipation? So according to us, it's infrequency, and generally that's less than three times a week. It could be altered stool consistency, and generally that is defined as Bristol stools one or two, or it could be a defecation disorder, and we define that with straining, include emptying, etc. But what is constipation to our patients? And this is where it gets a little bit tricky. So yes, of course, infrequency, hard stools, difficulty emptying, but also they describe bloating, nausea, abdominal pain, rectal fullness. They often describe, certainly my patient cohort, they're toxic with headaches and feeling awful and sick. Often not symptoms actually ascribed to their bowel. We have lots of different treatment options available to us with lots of different targets. And therefore, knowing how to apply those and apply those most effectively is really critical. And the best way to do that is to try and understand the physiology, although there's a lot of complexity with that. When we look at symptoms of constipation, clearly you're going to divide and rule out secondary causes of constipation. That is a really key phenotyping role that we as gastroenterologists play, and it is often overlooked. Now that may be neurological, as Charlie has alluded to, maybe endocrinological or structural. Some of those may not be changeable though. 
The other really important component to consider when you're phenotyping your patients is the medications, with opiate-induced constipation being the elephant in the room, with actually huge numbers of patients on these medications. And while sometimes it can be very difficult to address those and do opiate detoxification, it really is a key thing up front to discuss with your patients. The other key things not to miss, though, are the psychotropic medications, the antipsychotics, the cardiac medications, which are highly prevalent. And then also a lot of the medications that we use as gastroenterologists for other symptoms worsen their lower GI symptoms. We're more interested, though, in the other arm of things, which is the functional constipation. And generally, we phenotype that into the IBS um, and functional constipation. When we try then to drill down on physiology, this group is, is really divided into non-motility, non-defecation disorder related. Those with slow transit or both a defecation disorder or a defecation disorder in isolation. And then, um, as we have been harping on about for quite some time now, the role of sensory dysfunction in constipation. On top of that though, oh sorry, with defecation disorder that also may be structural, as Charlie has discussed, or functional, or to complicate things, both. On top of all that, though, we also have major psychosocial contributors to presentation with gut symptoms, and they need to be considered when we are looking at the phenotype. So why do we phenotype? Why is it necessary? Is it necessary? And I guess we're still answering some of those questions. Clearly, we need to exclude the structural causes that are going to be managed quite differently. And it makes sense to phenotype to help guide our treatment goals. You know, why would you use a laxative if their transit time is completely normal? Why would you send them to multiple physiotherapy appointments, take up hours of their time if there's no problems with emptying? And really what we're hoping to do is take that really nice long list of possible therapies that we can apply here, and rather than just a scattergun approach, targeting it somewhat more to the physiology in the hope that we improve our outcomes. And certainly there are definite studies that have shown that is the case. Now, how do we do that? How do we phenotype? Well, the bowel is a really inarticulate beast. You know, it has really limited ways that it can express itself. So what symptoms have we got at our disposal? And maybe are they useful, Charlie, or the quality of them? Certainly we're not going to be doing anything if they don't have symptoms. So we have stool consistency, frequency, evacuatory symptoms, and perhaps other symptoms. So how do they help us with phenotyping? Well, they do to a degree. Stool consistency does correlate reasonably well with colonic transit. Mm. My favourite thing in this meeting is to say studies performed last century, and a number of them are last century. We've known this information for a very long time. So this study here, patients were given either Senna or Loperamide, and they looked at their stool form in comparison to their transit. So there's a really good correlation there. It's also been um, looked at by the Cetaceous group in individuals with constipation and health, and again did find that the consistency correlated quite well with um, colonic transit. Frequency, however, does not. Um, so that's an important thing to consider. You kind of intuitively would think that it would be important, but, it, but it's really that consistency. Um, in terms of um, determining whether they have slow transit or not, um, and therefore presumably applying a diagnosis of constipation, uh, this study here also looked at um, the different stool forms and the sensitivity and specificity here. And certainly type 1 and 2 stools, very specific for delayed colonic transit. But, and this is a study that I did when I was doing my PhD, looking at patients with constipation and healthy controls. And of course, yes, we found that patients with constipation had much greater rates of type 1 and 2 stools. However, actually the most common stool type that the patients reported was still a type 4 stool. So it's really useful if we see those old stool consistencies, but many patients don't fit into that group. And what about symptoms of evacuatory dysfunction? Well, this has been looked up on a number of occasions really to try and identify this. And we really have found that there's no single symptom that predicts the presence or absence of dyssynergia. Or importantly, and for me as a clinician, the response to treatment with the pelvic floor physiotherapists. So we do need to do better. So what about other symptoms? Well, we've published this study recently. It's work I did when I was doing my PhD at the London and looking at the urge to defecate. And there is a clear differences between patients with normal sensation and patients with hyposensitivity. 
and that is different from those with constipation and those with health. Also importantly is the abnormal patterns were associated with more severe symptoms and actually evacuatory dysfunction. And while with our analysis we could see, clearly see differences, quantifying that as you can see from the images, yes there's a difference but all the areas are still lighting up with large overlap is difficult. So overall, are symptoms helpful? And I guess I have to go back to Charlie's uh, discussion before. In short, no, they're really not. We need to know they're there. We're not going to treat patients who don't have symptoms, but the quality of the symptoms as we currently use them are not particularly helpful. Although it is possible we're not answering, answer, asking sorry, the right questions of our patients. The problem with the bowel, and particularly lower GI, and compared to the upper GI, we've had numerous discussions at this meeting about the fact that anorectal manometry is so much more complex to interpret compared to upper GI, is that there is never just one contributor. On top of that, they all interact and make each other worse. If you have altered colonic motility, you get altered fluid resorption, that changes the stool consistency. If we change the stool consistency, that increases our likelihood of developing rectal evacuatory dysfunction. If we don't evacuate properly, our feedback loops slow down our colonic manometry, and so on and so forth. So a lot of our treatment is trying to break that cycle. So if we agree, and I think we all do, that we have multiple different physiological targets in treating our patients with constipation. And I think we all also agree that improving our understanding of those physiological targets and who they apply to improves our treatment out, um, outcomes. We also know symptoms are pretty average at defining physiology. And we also know that controversy exists as the best test. So where do we go from here? And I'm hoping my very learned colleague here who's done all the studies, has got the answers. So I'm going to hand over to Satish, who can walk us through that. Thank you, Rebecca. That's a very tall order. I appreciate that, though. <laughs> now let me get to my slides. Mark, I'm getting good at this. <laughs> uh oh. Oh, it did, did come through. It's not coming up here. There is a trick for bringing it up here, too. Oh. Did I press something? Oh, that's unusual. So um, I'm still learning. No, I'm, this is a new one on the final day. <laughs> Um, hmm. yeah, I think I should just go on. All right. There you go. I didn't do anything special. Well, thank you. You rescued me. So uh, thank you, Rebecca, for really taking the tougher part of this uh, presentation and really trying to help us define the the symptoms and the history. And so what I'm going to do very quickly is try and look at the various tools that we have available to us when we s encounter a patient in the clinic with symptoms of constipation and or dyssynergic defecation. The, the really big focus of my talk will be really defecatory disorders. So we'll look at, we, these are the tools we have, right? Every day when we see our patients, we can take a good history, we can uh, maybe prospectively collect their symptoms using stool diary. Of course, a digital rectal examination is critical, and then the tools that we debated uh, until cows came home yesterday in rectal manometry, balloon expulsion test, colonic transit test, and, and defecography. <coughs> so let's ask a quick question, and I think Charlie alluded to quite well, really, is how accurate is a patient's history of constipation? Remember, these patients are suffering for very long periods of time, and we are, they're, they're having a 15, 20-minute encounter with us, and you're asking them, you're firing away these questions, and they're really relying on their recall to help guide you about their symptoms. And then we are using those 15-minute interview to guide the rest of their uh, interaction with us in terms of what we do for them. So how accurate is this? So we did a simple survey. We collected symptoms, and we asked them to actually give their symptoms on a nine or 10-stem questionnaire. 
and then we had them keep a prospective diary for a week or two. And then we looked at this. What, the bottom line, very poor concordance between what the patient tells us to what we find on a prospective diary. If you look at the number of bowel movements, only 30% of the time they really are accurate. Bowel stool consistency, the same. Straining, use of digital maneuvers, 50% of the time we are accurate, and so on and so forth, incomplete bowel movements. So history per recall generally is inaccurate. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't get the history, but I'm just kind of bringing you that the history per se is, is not very, very accurate. So then that leads us to what else can we do to improve our history gathering story. The best way, I think, really is to do prospective stool diaries. And, and we can do this either using paper form stool diaries, but then we run into the problem that Charlie alluded to, that many people don't like doing this, and they fill it out in the car park just before they're coming to see it. Oh, doctor, I was going to ask me this. I, I better do this, you know? Otherwise, he's, he's not going to really treat me. Another way, of course, is to do it with digital apps, because now these are becoming very popular, and more important, everybody wants to carry their phone everywhere, particularly to the loo, particularly our constipated patients, because they sit there for quite some time. So they have all the time to fill it up. So <laughs> we have tried to work on developing some of these tools, uh, the, uh, and then we tried to do a prospective comparison against the paper diary, validating it against the app. And, and suffice to say that the, within first and second week, the app does fairly well in terms of interclass correlation, and then when we compare the app with the paper form, again, there is fairly good correlation. So this, this does seem to work. So I think that may be one way for us to get a more accurate history. Now let's talk about digital rectal exam. I think Ruben is here somewhere in the audience. There he is. So Ruben did this very nice study a long time back and uh, uh, surveyed Adil, myself, Dr. Wald, and Dr. Drossman, and so on. And really, we found that rectal examinations uh, are not very popular. They are very few people. If you look in, in, in terms of how many they've done it, very little done in primary care, internal medicine, and medical students. And of course, the bulk of them are primarily done in GI practice, either fellows or faculty. And why? Well, there are many, many challenges here. There's lack of training during medical school and residency. There are sociocultural barriers, which are increasing, uh, uh, at least in the United States. The optimal approach and standardization remains a little challenge, and there's lack of enthusiasm amongst gastroenterologists. Everybody says, I've done a rectal exam. When? Just before the colonoscopy, when the patient is asleep. Uh, and so, is it clinically useful? Well, I think, I don't want to spend too much time. This is a very learned audience, and I think you all know about how to do a, a systematic good rectal exam, but we have described this in several papers. But there are the really three steps. You inspect the perineum, you evoke the inocutaneous reflex, you pass your gloved index finger into the rectum and evoke squeeze at least twice, push maneuver twice, and then clinically you can pick up dyssynergia if any two of these are present. With the caveat that this is a patient in the left lateral position, you're a stranger, you're inserting your finger into the butt, asking them to do something they do routinely in privacy, and you're a stranger. So there are all those ifs, but nonetheless, if it is normal, at least it'll exclude the likelihood of an underlying dyssynergic defecation. But if it is abnormal, then at least you have a high suspicion index that there could be underlying dyssynergia. Is this um, uh, clinically useful? Yes, I think this was done in a prospective study. Uh, and of course, this is this finger here. Uh, and its sensitivity and specificity is what you can see compared to a balloon expulsion test. So yes, I think we can do it. But there is also important information for a trainee here. There is a learning curve. It is not intuitive, and you're not going to learn this overnight. And here we did a very nice study where we took junior trainees, first-year fellows. They were trained on 10 rectal examinations by me in tandem with the per patient's permission. And then they, they did about 110 patients, uh, again in tandem, and this was blinded. They recorded their findings. I recorded my findings. And in terms of picking up dyssynergia, the yield was 35%. But the same trainees, when they became seniors, their yield goes up to 68%. Fecal incontinence pick up 59 and 92% in terms of abnormalities uh, on the regular exam. And normal, 30% in the beginning and 100% at the end. So there is a learning curve, and we can all get good at this.
So we have all of these tools. We've discussed balloon expulsion test, manometry, a colon transit, and so on. And in terms of dysynergia, I think we've already talked about all the various types, and you're all very familiar with this. I think one of the points that I do want to make is when we assess for dysynergia using anorectal manometry, we are primarily relying, uh, most labs anyway, tend to do this in the lying position. And this was also the issue with the Grossi study, where they had 80% yield. The study was done in the lying position without any sensation of defecation in the subject. And this pattern, you will. this is a subject which we had. You can see in the lying position, it looks very classic dysynergia. Same patient, you sit them up on a commode, completely normal pattern. So you can change the pattern just by position. I know even Adil mentioned this in his presentation yesterday. So we have to, if we have to do tests, we have to really look at doing this as close to normal physiology as possible. No, we can never mimic what happens to the patient in the, at home, in the, in the toilet. But we can come closer to this, and this is one way to doing this. So relying on dysynergia in the left lateral position is inaccurate. We have to have them sit, sit up and do it. Now, unfortunately, as Enrique pointed out, it, if you're using a 3D high definition, you cannot do that, sadly. I don't know, Rebecca had some uh, concerns about how they have to do this in Australia, which is, was very, uh, I was very uh, interested to learn that. But using high resolution, we can sit them up and we can get this pattern. So uh, then what is the diagnostic yield of uh, anorectal function tests in patients with difficult defecation? So this, this was a study we did almost 20 years ago. We took 100 patients with difficult defecation, and they were all assessed with anorectal manometry, balloon expulsion test, colonic transit study, and defecography. This is barium defecography, not MR. And 70 patients had abnormal anorectal manometry or a dyssynergy pattern. 30 of them were normal. So then we asked the question, well, what is the yield of, of tests? Right? If you have to have all three tests abnormal, uh, including manometer, four tests really, transit plus balloon expulsion time plus defecography plus dyssynergia pattern, mm. your yield is likely to be only 23%. If you only look at transit plus defecography and a dyssynergia, it's 29%. Balloon expulsion time, abnormal, plus defecography, abnormal, 27%. But if you just have dyssynergia, abnormal balloon expulsion time, and a transit, your yield is going to be 70%. So in, in my practice, I find very little use for routine defecography. I will use it in selective cases. In terms of even looking at the dyssynergia types, you can see balloon expulsion time or, or, or all of this will give you this yield. But if you really take away defecography from the equation, the yield does not change. So we can get, with just manometry and balloon expulsion time, most of the information we need. And in, sel in selected cases, colonic transit study will give that additional yield where sometimes we have that, uh, I think I will use the term probable uh, uh, dyssynergia. And maybe colonic transit time will give us the other additional information that we may need to help with this. So uh, based on this, this is the Rome, Rome criteria that you're all familiar. I'm not going to spend too much time. Ah. Sorry, Adil, I apologize. This is not, uh, it didn't come out very well when I pasted it. But I think this study has already been mentioned. I think this is probably one of the best studies I personally think has been done. Adil did a very uh, large survey of, of uh, patients and healthy controls, uh, much better than our own study that we published years ago. And, and suffice to say that you know, what he described was that if you have abnormal manometry, uh, use a pattern or, or gradient, plus balloon expulsion time, I think you will pick up the vast majority of patients with dyssynergic defecation. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the main message of, of this paper. And occasionally, there will be some issues. So my take-home points are straightforward. Recognition of constipation phenotypes requires multimodal approach. And that requires history, perhaps a prospective stool diary, and physiological tests. It's only then we can come closer to really putting them into some kind of a category. For dyssynergic defecation, anorectal manometry and balloon expulsion tests is mostly adequate. Additionally, we may have to rely on defecography or colonic transit studies, where the index of suspicion is high, but only one of those tests are abnormal. Uh, we'll forget IBSC. And then rectal sensitivity, again, an issue that we have uh, discussed intermittently in this, in this meeting, 
but it is important to recognize that there are these phenotype patients where, where they may have significant defecatory dysfunction, but they may not really show dyssynergia. And balloon expulsion time may also be normal, but they really have profound sensory dysfunction. And I think Mark Scott really and his group have done outstanding work for many years on this. And this is another abnormality that can only be picked up using a manometric test. Either you use a manometry or rectal barostat, uh, and I think that would be the way to go. Again, for hypersensitivity, this would be the test. So those are my thoughts for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think you went a long way to answering some of those questions. Um, the next part of this session is hopefully a little bit more interactive. Um, we might, should we ask the faculty to come up to the front, Paul, just so we can have more interaction? Or are you happy to present the case and then go from there? Mark, what's your I, preference? I think, well, there's a couple of seats. So why don't all three people who are part of this session come to the front? And I can just take the... OK, fantastic. So welcome to our pelvic floor MDT. We're hoping from opinions for everyone. Well, thank you everyone for staying until the final session of this uh, conference. Um, I will start this session by presenting a case of Miss B, a 43-year-old teacher who was referred to the... It's not me. <laughs> she, she was referred to the London Physiology Unit a few years ago when I did my PhD there. Uh, for symptoms of difficulty in <coughs> rectal evacuation. Um, her medical history included IBS, lower back pain, panic attacks, and an anal fissure, which was previously treated by Botox injections. Uh, she has had two vaginal deliveries, one of which was associated with a perineal tear. And her symptoms included constipation since her teenage years. Uh, she currently opens her bowels once per three days, passing hard stools. And evacuation is always incomplete and always is prolonged, takes up about uh, 30 minutes in total. And she tells me that uh, because of her job, she is unable to uh, open her bowels uh, when she has the urge to defecate, and the urge disappears when she uh, needs to defecate the urge uh, for more than two minutes. She only had two incontinence episodes so far. So for her lower back pain, she was on cocodamol, and she was using the oral contraceptive pill and she previously trialed procalapride and linecrotide in the past without any success for symptoms of constipation. So we performed anorectal physiology studies in her, and I will summarize the most important results here below. So first, we performed rectal sensory testing, and in this patient, two out of the three sensory thresholds were abnormally elevated, so she was diagnosed with rectal hyposensitivity according to the London Protocol. And we also performed a defecography study in her. And rectal emptying was far from complete. She only expelled 50% of the contrast in three minutes. Although it only showed a moderate-sized rectal seal and no other structural abnormalities. So the practitioner diagnosed her with a functional evacuation <laughs> with disorder, which was uh, uh, associated with her rectal hyposensitivity. So we all know that rectal hyposensitivity can be defined as reduced rectal sensation to all modalities of stimuli. And the gold standard uh, test to diagnose someone with rectal hyposensitivity is to perform a rectal barostat study. Although in, in clinical practice, most centers use mechanical or balloon distension uh, for the diagnosis, and they uh, evaluate three sensory thresholds, the first constant sensation volume, the defecatory desire volume, and the maximum tolerable volume. And you all know this uh, uh, figure of the London classification on uh, disorders of rectal sensation. And for now, we only focus on rectal hyposensitivity and not on rectal hypersensitivity. And I don't know if you are all able to read this, but based on expert opinion in the London classification, it was uh, decided that at least two out of the three rectal sensory thresholds needed to be abnormally elevated to diagnose someone with rectal hyposensitivity. <clears throat> and this was classified as a major finding. And if only one uh, sensor tr tr sensory threshold is elevated, abnormally elevated, it was classified as borderline rectal hyposensitivity. And this was considered an inconclusive finding. Although there are several studies, so there are some evidence, some recent evidence, that even these patients with borderline rectal hyposensitivity uh, do have more, uh, more symptoms of constipation compared to those patients with normal rectal sensation. And I will show you 
uh, this right now. So first of all, a couple of years ago, we performed a study in almost 3,000 patients referred to the London Physiology Unit with symptoms of refractory constipation. And we showed that borderline rectal hyposensitivity was associated with higher Cleveland Clinic constipation scores compared to patients <coughs> with normal rectal sensation. So we showed that the linear relationship existed between the number of sensory thresholds which were abnormally elevated and symptom severity according to the Cleveland Clinic constipation score. And this is perfectly shown in the figure on the right hand side over here, where you can see the individual symptoms of uh, constipation according to the Cleveland Clinic constipation score. And the bars represent the number of abnormal sensory thresholds. So the bar on the left hand side, the white bar is normal rectal sensation or zero abnormal sensory thresholds. And the bar on the right hand side is three abnormal sensory thresholds. And we found that 25% of this population had borderline rectal hyposensitivity. And not much later in the same year, the group of Ellison performed a study which confirmed the results in almost 1500 females um, referred for uh, anorectal physiology of whom almost 600 had symptoms of constipation. And they showed that borderline rectal hyposensitivity was again associated with symptoms of constipation here. And again, the higher the, num the number was of abnormal sensory thresholds, improved the yield of having symptoms of constipation. And they showed that again, 27% of this population had borderline rectal hyposensitivity. So there are some very recent data uh, from Korea, which have been uh, presented at the DDW last week by CEO at, and colleagues. And I think Dr. Jung, you were on the, one of the authors as well in almost 2,500 patients uh, referred for functional defecation disorder, and they literally sh showed the same results. So borderline rectal hyposensitivity was associated with a higher Cleveland con clinic constipation score compared to patients with normal rectal sensation. And again, a linear relationship existed between the number of abnormal sensory thresholds and symptom severity according to the Cleveland clinic constipation score and 23% of their population had borderline rectal hyposensitivity. So based on these three relatively large cohorts of patients referred for refractory symptoms of uh, constipation or functional defecation disorder, we can conclude that almost 25% of these patients had borderline rectal hyposensitivity. So I think a valid question is to ask whether uh, borderline rectal hyposensitivity is correctly classified as an inconclusive finding or that it should be reclassified as a minor finding in the next uh, London iteration, or even as a major finding. So in terms of treatment, I think uh, these patients benefit most from sensory biofeedback with a success rate of about 50 to 80%, depending on the type of training. So syringe versus barosat assisted training as uh, shown by Satish and colleagues a couple of years ago. And also Ms. B corresponded well to uh, uh, syringe-assisted uh, training in this case. Um, so I want to open the discussion by asking Ellison, what do you think of the uh, borderline rectal hyposensitivity patients? Do you think one abnormal sensory threshold is clinically relevant in these patients? Thank you. I, I am struck with the similarity between our three studies. However, we uh, looked at constipation and incontinence, and we didn't just look at functional diseases, we looked at organic diseases. And we had our eye on the London classification, so we analysed it carefully, whether you met one threshold or two thresholds, etc. And we also came out in favour of choosing one threshold. We found it didn't reduce the specificity of the test. But I would still advocate that um, to force uh, three different sensations into one umbrella term I is not the best option. Mm. I think it's better to consider the relative hyper and hyposensitivity in each of the thresholds because I think they mean different things and we treat them differently. And when you perform uh, biofeedback in these patients, do you uh, look at one specific threshold or do you use them all in your treatment? Yes, well, we definitely guide biofeedback according to the findings on the original test. So if they have just hyposensitivity to the first sensation, we'll work on that. If they have hyposensitivity markedly to all three thresholds, I think that has implications and you're not going to get anywhere till you really address the improving the rectal emptying 
Yes, yeah, so open for questions from the audience as well. <clears throat> practitioner from Switzerland, so I see the, the thing here a little bit different. Uh, I believe you have to ask if the chicken or the egg was first. And I believe the hyposensitivity is just, if you are constipated for 20 years, then probably you get uh, hyposensitive because the rectum is like a brain and it, it learns. Yeah. So I think that's a valid question. And uh, with the three studies that we've shown, we've only proven associations and not causation. Mm. And I think it's very difficult to perform a study to prove causation because it will t probably take decades to prove that uh, patients, well, that it is a result of the constipation um, and not uh, the cause itself. I can add a little bit to that. When um, my work at the London, we looked at patients with rectal hyposensitivity and there's definitely a number of phenotypes within that group. So we did um, both barostat sensation, thermal sensation, electrical sensation and EEG responses as well. And there was definitely groups where it seemed much more an inattentive problem with altered cortical processing and there was a group that had clear changes in their electrical thresholds and all modalities as well. So I think it's still a heterogeneous group. Yeah. But along on that theme, what about the opioids? I mean, opioids are known yeah. to cause visceral hyposensitivity. I mean, there's an extensive literature in the bladder and some literature, including your own, in the rectum. Yeah. Yeah, so we've done a, a study in about 20 hundred patients referred for constipation as well to the physiology unit and we uh, have shown that there's an association between rectal dysfunction or rectal sensory dysfunction and the use of opioids. Again, this is an association and not uh, it's not relying on causation, but I think there are various uh, studies in healthy volunteers that show causation here. And we see that there's a big, big influence or, or an association with rectal dysfunction, which is probably even greater than with uh, slow transit colon here. Um, and that might be a reason why uh, uh, medications such as naloxagol don't show any um, good results in patients with slow transit colon, but we might have to uh, uh, evaluate the effect on sensory dysfunction in these patients. So that's really the extension of the testing. Do you think that a patient like this is on, patient is on cocodamol? I yeah. think you told us that at the start. Yeah. Should, is that a therapeutic approach you would consider, in, or the audience would consider in patients who are chronically on opioids? I think definitely uh, we have to stop the patient taking the opioids, but if it's not possible, we need to look at other treatment options. But uh, I don't know what the experience is uh, with the people from the audience. Well, I think if you're on opioids, you will get hyposensitive rectum. There's a high probability. So uh, I want to make a quick comment about one versus two thresholds. And that is, you know, we are relying on, this is n not a true objective test. It is a semi-subjective, semi-objective test, sensory testing, which is very different than some of the other things we do, like measuring resting pressures and squeeze pressures and so on and so forth. So here, and, and these patients have never experienced a balloon in their rectum. Suddenly we've placed a balloon in the rectum and we're asking them to describe certain sensations. So there is a much higher subjectivity in this. So we need to take these sensations that they report with a little grain of salt. Mm -hmm. And that is why I find that, especially if we're going to subject these patients to treatment, one thing is showing association, but the next step is what are you going to do with this hyposensitivity? Yeah. If we are going to subject them to treatment, especially something like a syringe assisted, sensory training is a little bit more tougher than doing uh, motor coordination training in my hands. So I would prefer that we use a slightly higher threshold for defining the group as having true rectal hyposensitivity. And that's why I prefer two. Once they have two or more thresholds, it's very likely that they are hypersensitive. I'm not saying that people who have one abnormal threshold are not hypersensitive, but really when we have to determine treatment, we need to have a slightly higher threshold. Yeah. That's my plea, thank you. I think definitely um, it is a subjective uh, test, although we have shown with three different uh, individual sites that the results are, uh, well, almost the same, almost identical. So I think in about 6,000 patients, if we can still say that the results are the same, then there must be some something in there. But, and again, 
Uh, well, I think uh, uh, biofeedback is probably one of the only options that you have in these patients, because if someone has re uh, refractory or very severe rectal hyposensitivity, do you see these patients in your surgical clinic? Is that something that patients are referred with uh, severe rectal hyposensitivity? And are there any problems to solve these uh, things? Well, personally, I haven't had the, that type of a referral for, for uh, the past years. I would think it would be a, a rather exotic indication for any type of surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, among those, clearly, sacral neuromodulation would be the one that I could think of. Um, as we know that um, SNM will um, lead to some improvement of um, rectal hyposensitivity, but clearly this being the only finding in the workup, I'd be very hesitant with surgery. That is. Do you see um, rectal hypersensitivity, especially at small volumes, in people with rectal seal, for example? Is that a potential sort of confounder, if confounder is the right word? Um, it may be. It may be. I think with rectal seals, um, among surgeons, we're, we're similarly cautious, simply because the rectal seal is such a common finding. Um, literally, when we examine um, females, and we do a lot of digital rectal, rectal examinations in, in, in our practice, so this is a very common finding. And then again, having a rectal seal as a as a simple or as a single finding during the workup, clearly that, that raises the question whether or not these patients would be amenable to surgical therapy and benefit from that. So I think it's a, a difficult call to make, difficult to answer. Um, I don't think there's any large series available that would that would guide us in that direction. Okay. No, yeah. we we need, we need to move on to the next. Case. Thanks, Paul. The case I'm going to present today, I think, um, does encapsulate, encapsulate some of the, the topics that we've been talking about. And this lady's journey begins at age 32, after a normal pregnancy and uh, spontaneous going into labour. She then went on to suffer a fourth degree tear with forceps and a large baby and what seems like a very long labour, 56 hours. And she was said to have a repair at the time. So this lady suffered an oasis or an obstetric anal sphincter injury syndrome. And so that means she's had an injury right through to the anal epithelium. And no one, um, no one uh, cannot have an, an obstetric uh, anal sphincter injury. And I understand even the finest um, obstetric care in the UK can still lead to this. So I thought it might be interesting to just point out while you're sitting there and while I'm standing here, there are some loads on the anal sphincter in the order of 20, 30, 40, Newtons, but when you are passing a perhaps four kilogram bowling ball through the um, vagina, the, the things are very different mm. and the forces really ramp up, especially if you use a vacuum device or if you use forceps, the force is really getting up there at 313 Newtons. In the interest of time, I will just move on to the first question that I think a patient like this might have. As soon as they find they've had a fourth degree tear and they start looking, they wonder if they will get future faecal incontinence. So I thought maybe we could have a Swiss poll, which I understand is just a show of hands. Perhaps if you were counselling such a patient, would you say that they have a less than 30% chance of faecal incontinence in the medium term? Or would you think they had a more than 30% chance of faecal incontinence in the longer term? So I just had a little go at trying to answer that question. I thought it was interesting to point out, if you just take the patients who've had forceps only, their prevalence is you know, modest at 13% of faecal incontinence, but there's a lot of them that are troubled with troublesome flatus incontinence. And look at this number here, 20% don't have faecal incontinence, but they're quite troubled with faecal urgency. But to get at the actual question, I found studies to find your risk in the medium term of faecal incontinence is 23% if you include both third and fourth degree tears, but 30% if you include a fourth degree tear. So I think that means everyone in the audience was correct. Um, in Australia, and I can see in other parts of the world, um, everyone was noticing a, a significant increase in number of tears, and there's been national initiatives in many countries to try and reduce the number of tears, including things like um, warm compressors in the sec second stage of labour, and a hands-on approach trying to basically 
halt the speed of passage of that bowling ball through the, through the perineum, and um, in particular to really stop midline episiotomies. There were still one or two obstetricians doing these in Australia before this initiative. And in Australia, that has led to some reduction in tears. And for quite some time, there's been um, evidence-based guidelines on how to repair a tear when it happens to do it immediately in the operating room with good lighting, good anesthesia, certain, certain techniques. So the real first question that this patient has is what's going to happen next time? Should I have a caesarean for my next delivery? And I wonder if one of the chairs, perhaps Jose, could give his view on this or how he would handle that question. Wow. Uh, that's a very difficult answer because it's dependent on many factors. So I, I don't know if there is a right answer because it's probably this patient. She doesn't have symptoms now, but we have that she could have symptoms in the future, but uh, we, never, we never know. There, there is no a study that I... Uh, aware about there is something that can choose in this moment to suggest her a C-section. So I don't know what the, my colleagues think. I would tell her to have a C-section, but <laughs> we tell her to have one up front, to be honest with you. Um, I, I actually would do anorectal physiology studies here and really get an assessment of what the baseline is and what the structure is. Um, her baseline, if it's pretty poor, she's already pretty high risk, I would probably suggest a caesarean. And would you do an ultrasound, an anal ultrasound as well or not? I, I do. Um, I think the clinical examination is often quite helpful there. You know, if they've had a dehiscence of the repair or something, that's often yeah. really clearly obvious. Um, but I do just to quantify where we're at and to relate that to what's happening from a physiology point of view and then use that to guide. So um, my thoughts were in particular, the first question you need to ask us, are you having symptoms at the moment? That changes things considerably. Um, and to be upfront that you do have a, a greater chance of another tear if you have a vaginal delivery and perhaps how many babies do you want to have? Because if you have numerous cesarean sections, there are significant um, risks associated with that as well. But when I looked to societies for guidelines, I just got comments like no recommendation or literature is supportive of a case-by-case -case discussion. May, may I have a, a comment? I think this is the questions that the OBGYNs should ask because the patient is not with us already. So I think this is the kind of message that we need to work together because this patient will be with us yeah. maybe in 10 years. So yeah. I think this is a critical part to how to prevent. So I think this is something that I was discussing with Enrique last night, that this is something that we need to go abroad with OBGYNs and try to work together to prevent. Yeah. So as Rebecca said, um, there are some protocols, not firm guidelines, to do anorectomometry and 